Now we'll have the fifth presentation, Dr. Srikant Shetty from Fortis Hospitals, Bangalore. Uh, good afternoon, Chairpersons. Uh, uh, thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. I present this uh, uh, case. A 55-year-old gentleman, smoker, had a previous uh, inferior MI, underwent a primary PCI with a Cypher Select DES to a dominant circumflex two years ago and he was compliant with the dual antiplatelet and he was readmitted with us with a uh, repeat inferior MI. His uh, uh, previous angioplasty was elsewhere and so we loaded him with prasugrel and aspirin and we took him up for a primary angioplasty. The review of his uh, old cath shows an aneurysmally dilated circumflex in the pre-stent segment with a significant residual thrombus within the aneurysm at the end of the procedure. That was two years ago. This uh, left coronary shoot shows a dominant circumflex which is uh, occluded at the uh, tip of the aneurysm, that's at the mouth of the previous stent. So we proceeded with the, uh, gave him a, uh, intravenous uh, abscissimab and proceeded with the angioplasty. Circumflex is wired and, uh, and as you can see we have taken a, a small undersized balloon to, uh, to a predilatation, a tentative predilatation so that we wouldn't displace too much uh, thrombus over there. And uh, what we can notice over here is with the balloon in place, the, there is a distal flow, uh, the, um, the significance of which uh, I, I would realize a little later. However, the balloon dilatation did not uh, uh, establish any flow, so I did uh, multiple runs of uh, clot aspiration. Again, with the same result, there was no flow established. And then I did uh, uh, more definitive balloon dilatations within the stented segment without uh, any flow being established. Now what, what was also happening was uh, because it was an ectatic vessel uh, with thrombus and uh, 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 no flow, I couldn't visualize the uh, distal vessel. So what I did was to take the uh, clot aspiration catheter into the stented segment and uh, uh, gave uh, uh, vasodilators, uh, nitroposide and adenosine through the uh, clot aspiration catheter and then took a uh, selective shoot to allow visualization of the distal vessels and we could see fairly uh, good sized uh, branches over there, OMs and the uh, LPDA which is seen occluded in its uh, mid segment with a thrombus. Sorry. So I took the clot aspiration catheter uh, selectively into the LPDA and uh, uh, injected three milligrams of uh, TPA. The, the dose uh, borrowed from what we do in our uh, stroke patients, ischemic stroke patients, where we give boluses of uh, three milligram TPA to, uh, for a total of uh, 12 milligram. And then repeated a clot aspiration and more uh, selective injection of uh, vasodilator. And now you see that the flow is uh, established, TIMI3 flow, uh, pain subsided but uh, we can still see a lot of uh, residual clot at the mouth of the uh, stent. Now at this point I had to decide how I would uh, deal further with this uh, thrombus and obviously clot aspiration or ballooning wouldn't be uh, very effective because uh, any further uh, ballooning in that segment would only displace the clot uh, downward. And since he was hemodynamically stable and pain free with a good flow, uh, I thought I would anticoagulate him uh, gave him an infusion of abscissimab for uh, 24 hours, continued anoxaparin uh, for uh, 3 days and uh, uh, he would have intermittent uh, chest pain. And then once uh, the paraphernalia that I wanted was organized, I took him back uh, to the cath lab on the third day. And uh, what we see is that the vessel is uh, re-occluded and he was having mild chest pain. So it meant that I had to achieve recanalization of this uh, uh, vessel. So I took a, a long balloon also with the intention of uh, uh, sizing the length of the 
aneurysm. And as you can see, the moment the balloon is in place, the vessel is open. So uh, just as it was right at the beginning, what was uh, happening was the clot that was sitting at the mouth of the stent was uh, acting like a, a flap valve or a, a ball valve and occluding the mouth of the uh, stent. So whatever strategy I would adopt had to exclude this thrombus from the lumen. And uh, how would I do that in this uh, uh, huge aneurysm and which was quite lengthy? And uh, by this time I had organized the stent grafts. And as you can see, this stent graft, which is the longest that is available, 28 millimeter, is not long enough to straddle the aneurysmal segment. Uh, though it just aborts the uh, normal uh, segments, it wouldn't be sufficient to uh, hold the uh, stent graft in place. So which means I would have, ha I would have to put uh, two uh, overlapping stent grafts, but how would you uh, 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 stabilize the two stent grafts within the aneurysm? So I thought of a strategy that I would put a long stent. Uh, in this case, I used a Zines Prime because a long bare metal was not available. 38 millimeter Zines Prime to straddle the aneurysm merely to act as a scaffold within which the two stent grafts would be deployed in a overlapping fashion. So here I deploy the uh, Zines Prime stent. Obviously, I, I wouldn't expect the aneurysm to be closed by this. This is only to act as a scaffold. And then when I deploy the stent grafts, I have to be mindful of the branches on either side. So uh, I deploy the first stent graft distally. And then take the second stent graft, position it carefully to avoid occluding the ostium of the proximal OM and deploy it and then post dilated within the uh, stent grafts to uh, achieve adequate expansion. You can still see that there is a minor endo leak which is seen at the proximal edge because the proximal stent graft was a little undersized, it was a 3.5 millimeter. So I took a larger balloon, 4 and 4.5 millimeter and post dilated. My concern here was how much, how much can you stretch the, uh, uh, the, the cloth? I mean, would it cause a rupture and a leak, uh, loss of structural integrity of the uh, graft? Uh, this, yeah, sorry, I'm just finishing. And I, f I stopped the procedure there and uh, took him back after three days for a check shoot and you can see only a minor uh, uh, leak persisting uh, with a good uh, TIMI 3 flow distally and the aneurysm being uh, entirely excluded. Thank you. Do you have any follow-up data on this patient? Yeah, this is uh, four months now and uh, he has, uh, there is clinical follow-up, but I plan to uh, do a check angiogram. Probably a CT angiogram uh, would be sufficient. My concern here is uh, what happens to the small uh, endolic that is uh, left behind. So I looked up data. Uh, there was, uh, though I couldn't get uh, coronary uh, data, there are uh, reports of uh, carotid and intracranial uh, aneurysms being excluded with stent grafts where minor endoleaks uh, left at the end of the procedure where uh, uh, you could treat that either by putting a larger bare metal stent within the uh, uh, proximal uh, stent graft to seal it off fully. And in patients where it was uh, followed up, uh, most of them uh, closed off by the uh, one year or two year uh, follow up period. Uh, do you need that long uh, DSA? You could have put the two covered strands rather than, why did you put that extra strand? Yeah. Was the, it necessary? Be, yes, for stabilization, uh, because uh, if, um, I, because I was not certain whether these two strands would uh, stay within each other. Because if I deploy the distal strand, and um, uh, if I am deploying without a scaffold, then I have to be well into the uh, distal normal segment, which would occlude any of the side branches. And uh, if I do not have a scaffold and I uh, only have the strategy for putting the stent grafts and if it gets displaced then I have no solution for that.